Welcome everyone. This is uh, Jim McGuire with Vita North America. In about 15-20 uh, seconds we'll go ahead and move forward with our today's uh, webinar. Uh, today we're going to talk about Enamic, uh, Vita Enamic, which is the uh, a hybrid if you will. And it can be used for both clinical and of course laboratory processing but we'll go through it and maybe give you some uh, information that maybe you're not aware of and hopefully you'll be able to uh, give it a shot and, and try this uh, unique material out. So we are doing weekly webinars every Thursday same time. All of you are currently in the mute mode. If you look at your uh, panel on the go to webinar panel there is a question box in which you can actually write out a question and send me and i'll either answer it during the uh, program or at the end we'll give you plenty of time also to type it out and to send me a question as well so if there's anything you're not sure about just uh give me a shout out and we will get to answer it so again thank you very much for joining us Today's Vita Learning webinar is Fabricating an Aesthetic Restoration with the Oni CAD CAM Monolithic Hybrid Machinable for Dentistry. And again, as I mentioned, this is good for either chair-side dentistry and our laboratories. There's plenty of laboratories that are also using this as an alternative material. Why is it the only true hybrid monolithic? Is because it the way it's designed and produced it's manufactured with an interconnecting network of polymer and ceramic, which makes it look uh, really nice uh, for aesthetically. Uh, plus, it gives you the translucency that you need as well. Today's webinar, as long as, we, as long as with others that we've done in the past, you can find all of these recordings on our social media, whether it's a YouTube channel, uh, Vita North America, the LinkedIn. Uh, the uh, Facebook and or Instagram. Uh, please check us out and look at some additional videos that we've done and also webinars. Again, we, we are going to do these uh, weekly webinars. We've done um, three in the past every Thursday, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. So stay tuned for next week as well, and we'll do another one. So when it comes to the CAD CAM materials, VITA has a wide variety of different materials. And it's often asked us, well, you know, how do we, how do we select which material for what product and so forth, for what indication? And it's true, you know, it, we, we all race to have new materials, uh, materials that are looking aesthetic, look like natural teeth, hold up long-term uh, clinically speaking. Uh, some like the strength, so maybe they go towards maybe a Vita Suprinity, which is actually the strongest lithium silicate material, machinable. It's crystallized, um, but it's well over 500 megapascals once you're done with it. Uh, Enamic, which is what we're going to speak today about. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit deeper. And then, of course, we have the, the true, like, felspathic type uh, restorations that have been around for machinable for the last 20 years and plus, which are remarkably uh, very clinically successful. Uh, that's why we call this material the, the Vita blocks, uh, like the gold standard, because we're looking at uh, well over the 85, 86% uh, success rate, clinical success rate, you know, over 18 years in situ or in place. And so it, it holds up really, really nice and it blends in with the dentition. The Enamic itself though, that is for either implant cases, and or natural tooth replacement, whether it's just enamel replacement or the posterior, but it's primarily purpose, the indication is really for um, stabilization of very um, hard chewing patient forces, whether it's on the implant or maybe there's some parafunctional habits that uh, you know have a lot of grinding, um, this material holds up really nice uh, long term. And the reason it, it does is because it's unique uh, material makeup, if you will. It is a, a 
combined material of polymer and ceramic. The ceramic portion is takes up about 85% of the uh, material uh, makeup, and then infiltrated into all the pores around the the strands of ceramic is polymer. So this is unique only because uh, the way it's designed. It, it actually, the ceramic is actually intertwined, interconnected with the polymer. There is no discrete portion like a composite. Composite, as we know, has like glass fill. And that glass fill is discrete particles that kind of are embedded in a sea of resin. So there's no structure to the ceramic. There's nothing to help prevent it from overbending. Uh, so this material with the ceramic, it's like rebar. It's interconnected in between uh, through the uh, throughout the entire material, and then it just has a little bit of uh, polymer within the veins, if you will, almost like a gold vein. Uh, and and that polymer, when forces are are chewing forces are um, trying to attack the the ceramic, the polymer itself actually absorbs the forces, dissipates those. And then the ceramic helps prevent it from fracturing. So we relatively see very few fractures of this material. I mean, it, it, it's just down. It's been out since 2013, and you know, there's very few um, uh, that I that I can recall that we've actually had somebody call and say, "Hey, it's it's, it's fractured." So because of this, uh, if we compare it for implant cases. We look at it and compare it to, say, zirconia, because zirconia is a big thing now where that, you know, it, it's strong, which, which it is. However, the strength also means hardness as well. So zirconia for an implant case, using zirconia as the abutment form with the hole through it, uh, may accelerate or may exacerbate the loads that are placed on that zirconia. And those zirconia forces uh, vibrate or move through the zirconia structure. And those, those forces, they drill down, they work themselves down to the implant abutment interface. And you can have overload because it, it's got excessive uh, loading. But this anamic material, in its uniqueness, because it absorbs that energy, absorbs the, the working forces um, from chewing, and from static pressure, you know, between the bolus of the food, it absorbs it. So when you compare it, enamic to a zirconia abutment side by side, enamic has about 70% more force absorbent ability compared to a zirconia implant abutment. So that's why this is a unique material for freestanding single tooth uh, enamel dentin replacement in the posterior. It can be milled down to one millimeter thick as a posterior in the occlusion. Uh, and it also can be used as a crown, an implant crown, whether cemented and or screw retained. Um, it's an ideal uh, material for very uh, high stress um, impact loaded uh, areas. So this is a unique case here that we have with the Enamic uh, because it's a bridge and Enamic is designed for single units only at this point. But let's say you've got a, a, a bridge or, or multiple units, you want to splint implants together. This is a unique way to do it is maybe produce a zirconia substructure, a connected substructure, and design it so that you have an overlay of a individual enamic crowns over each one of these um, abutment substructures. So it's a very unique where that you can make it screw retained. And then these uh, individual enamic crowns then are placed on top of the framework, the zirconia framework. Or you can make it so that there's uh, it's cement retained. But the enamic itself really absorbs all those stresses. So you can do wide, large framework designs, roundhouses, if you will, or fixed type uh, prosthetics uh, that go across the span, individual crowns for sure, but they can be bonded to, cemented to a framework, a substructure, if you will, and that you still have the absorption of those forces uh, for an implant case. Of course, even though it's very um, uh, tough during mastication to, to absorb forces, it can also be, look very beautiful for a veneer type substructure. 
So this is a case where you have a single veneer, and then you, you you have the enamic, which mills out really nice, and that looks really nice. As long as your substructure, your prep is a good color, you can really blend it in nice. If you have a inlay onlay, we actually have a enamic called ST, super translucent. And this is specifically for the um, for enamel replacements, either veneers and or inlays, onlays, and such. We have the multicolor as well, which picks up uh, real um, gingiva chroma, and it kind of blends into a nice enamel ST looking uh, occlusal point. Regardless of whatever uh, the enamic is, it looks very not much like a natural tooth. That's Vita. Vita's always trying to get to a point where they have a natural tooth as the end result. That's the desire, right? We want to replace teeth. We don't want to replace um, with a restoration or with a crown. We like to see a replacement tooth structure if possible. So you can see here different light uh reflecting against the Vita Namic. We try to mimic it because it's partially made up of, of Vita blocks uh, material ceramic. You kind of sim uh, have the same type of uh, light reaction, uh, fluorescence, opalescence uh, available that we have with the Mark uh, II, but it resembles very much like a natural tooth, which is really nice. So different lighting conditions, it works. This is a case, a unique case in which they they needed to close the diastema, right? So they wanted to know how thin can the enamic mill. Now, I can tell you that an inlay onlay, we can, in the you know, material selection, the material library, the design software, it will allow you to go down to about uh, five tenths of a millimeter for a veneer, you know, five to six tenths. Uh, this was stretching it, but they just wanted to see the concept, see if it worked. They had a unique patient. Um, so they actually were able to. Uh, mill a couple of veneers to close the diasma and to replace the uh, the enamel, some minimal prep, if you will. They kind of did these these windows here. So they milled them out and they came out with some nice results, some windows here, uh, almost veneers, very thin, down to about two tenths of a millimeter by the time they polished it. So they, they milled them and then they polished them. And then what they did was they went ahead and stained it to mimic natural dentition. You know, what was needed to blend in, to make it a little bit more, um, say, optically pleasing for uh, translucency. If you look real close here, you can see kind of the bluish here. This blue is actually the stains. These are the stains and then the yellowish, brownish uh, halo effect. Those are actually applied. So these are all applied to the to the veneer uh, before they place it. And then of course, if you use a neutral um, adhesive, um, bonding cement, uh, then you can actually use that uh, influence of characterization and it doesn't block out the light. So this of course, you know, you do need some good looking preps uh, that are close to what your end result is so that you can use a transparent uh, bonding cement. Otherwise, your bonding cement with these this thin veneers is going to show through. But you can make things really nice um, using this type of material. And of course, the end result, of course, you have something that looks natural. It reflects through the light, the remission of the light, the reflection, refraction uh, against that natural prep. Uh, you have everything there that's needed to replace the enamel or replace uh, Denton, if you will, uh, enamel, and to make this really stand out as an aesthetic case. So enamic itself, once you polish it, it does not get placed in a furnace. So there's no additional firing time. If you want to, you can just polish it. So you, you, there are some specialized uh, polishing wheels that you can use. They're pink and gray, uh, although we make one that is specific for our product, Enamic. Uh, there are others. Meisinger makes them, and Brasser makes a, a set as well specific for the Enamic. Uh, these are all nice. And then you have the uh, um, way to actually characterize it. And the way we characterize it is you don't polish it, but instead what you do is you mill it, you cut off that sprue, and then you're going to either 
etch it using a, uh, a 5% etch it material. You apply it, you rinse it, you apply it for 60 seconds, rinse it, and then you silenate the restoration. And then you go ahead and apply the uh, stains and the glaze. The stains are placed first, and then after that is cured, then you go back and you place the glaze on top of it so you seal those stains. So that's an alternative you need to characterize it, uh, which I will show you here in a second. And then uh, again, of course, uh, all these, uh, today's webinar and all the others that we've done in the past uh, are all on our social media sites. I'm going to go ahead and uh, show a picture of some other materials. Uh, so let me uh, show a different camera view. And we will get to this. There we go. And we are going to go to the full screen here. So now you should be able to see my screen here. This is an actual enamic block. Uh, this happens to be the, um, the multicolor, enamic multicolor. Um, I know the light's not the best, but here you can kind of see where that, if I turn it on right, you can kind of see where that you've got the cervical here, the gingiva, and then it blends up into an, an enamel. And that enamel is very natural-like. It's, it's like our ST, our super translucent uh, enamic material. So you can make some very beautiful restorations, whether they're anteriors or posteriors. These happen to be just glaze, no characterization. But if you can see here, and let's see if I can get this focused in a little bit more, uh, you can see somewhat the translucency already. So this is obviously is on a, a white stone model, but you can see here the translucent effect already present within this multicolor material. So we can produce something that has a um, a material that either for implants or standalone, in which posterior, anterior, in which we can then modify and polish and or stain and glaze if we want to. Uh, let me see if I can get that focus again. So you have many methods to deal with this material, whether it's anterior or posterior. And of course, like I said, you can actually create it and make implant crowns. So you can either do screw routine. Uh, access channel and then plug it up, right? You just plug it up with some composite. And then you have your anterior if you want. If you need a cement retain, this abutment itself can be designed and milled using the enamic so you, no matter what the cosmetic side, the, the superior crown is, the material, whether it's enamic, a Mark II, a Trilux, the Trinity, whatever it might be, even a zirconia crown, this abutment made out of enamic still produces that force absorbent um, reaction so that you reduce those stresses down uh, to that implant abutment level. So it's really nice by also having a maybe an enamic abutment, you also are able to change colors, right? Instead of having a pure white or an artificial tooth color, you can create these abutments with a nice uh, shade, a nice translucency that kind of blocks out the titanium base. And then, of course, come back, always come back. And you can create a restoration. Uh, this happens to be a, a Mark II Forte. So you can characterize it as you want, but you can produce something really nice by doing a two-piece there. You can also, if you wanted to, you can also use a composite to this material. Let's say that you had some of the neck showing uh, that you wanted to get rid of. There was some tissue recession around the cervical or so. Well, you can actually use a composite. Nice thing about this material is that you can use a composite, a pink composite, and you would etch the area that you're going to apply the composite to, and then you're going to uh, silenate it, you know, rinse it, silenate it, and then you're going to apply pink uh, gingiva uh, using a flowable material that we have, BMLC Flow. Uh, and these are the colors that it kind of represents. You know, any of these composites can be mixed 
and match to create the uh, the type of gingiva tone that you want to the cervical area as needed. So that's that's really nice as well. If you had a contact that might be loose, right, or open because when you go to seed it, maybe the contact's open. Uh, posterior, maybe you're grinding, you know, to try to make it seed because it's a prep um, draft, you know, the uh, um, insertion axis. Maybe you ended up having to cut off a a contact, and now it's open. If you wanted to add back into it, same thing. You just add some composite to it. So the testing that we've seen is that when you add a composite, if you do it right, if you um, etch it, silenate it, and then add your composite to it, you can then have a, um, a, a very nice attachment. And the testing has shown that it's more of a cohesive fracture than an adhesive fracture. So no properly done when you pull, try to pull the two parts uh, apart, that is gonna tear both of it open. So it's, it's got a very nice uh, seal to it and attachment to the enamic material. So let's say that you wanna do characterize it. These happen to be some stains uh, that we have here. There's an actual, there's a, a total of five stains. Um, I, ha I just have six stains, I have four here. They happen to be a, a white. Uh, a corn that we call corn, a brown, and a blue. These are the most useful. We also have a khaki, which is more of a, um, like a C shade, if you will. And then, of course, we have a black. And the black can always be uh, intermixed with any of these, or any of these can be intermixed with each other. You have uh, a fluid here. All of this is, of course, is light cured. So we have to be careful when we uh, use this. Uh, the minute you open it and you put it on a, uh, a petri dish or in a, a glass slab, uh, you know, the material once mixed is going to start curing. So I'm going to add, put a little bit of this stuff into your little uh, well here. And then we're going to have the a glaze itself, which is nothing more than like a liquid form. This enamic glaze, we'll pour that into a, another one of these. And just to keep them separated. And the glaze is nice. The glaze is always, you're going to use the glaze always after you stain and characterize. If you don't use the characterization stains, you still have an opportunity to either use the glaze to seal it, to make it polished like, uh, which is uh, looks like this one here. Uh, it's got a nice glaze to it. Before you do that, if you wanted to, you could take a couple burrs. Uh, you know, you can use like an inverted cone here and do a couple uh, uh, surface texturing if you want, right? Just go back and forth, right? Try to go in one direction, all right? And then you can come back and glaze over it and it'll fill in. And as long as you're careful, you're going to still have the texture, but it'll have the glossiness that, that you're looking for. Otherwise, you can polish it as well and it looks just as uh, polished. If you go ahead and polish it, you're going to use, uh, like I said, the, the, gr the pink and the gray wheel. Pink is kind of like a uh, pre-polisher, and then you can use the gray, which is the final polisher. But to really make it a nice, sweet um, glaze, if you will, you're then gonna use a uh, like a goat hair, and that'll put the finishing touch. If you haven't tried the goat hair on this, after you've used your your polishing wheels, you go ahead and use this goat hair afterwards. You are still around, um, you know, about a, uh, a 7,000 uh, RPM or less, low pressure, low uh, weight on your with your hand, and then you're going to really get a nice glaze out of it. So I've got a couple uh, crowns here. So here's a posterior here. So if I try to look at it, um, I have a, a connector here. I actually created, which is really nice, I created a pseudo prep, just old composite. And let's say your prep is A2, then you want to use an A2 composite. But you can make this into a handle if you'd like. It's also very nice because down by the margin, if you seal it up to the margin, when you go around and you start polishing it, if you decide to polish it instead, you're not going to gouge the, the margin. So 
this is a, a really nice way to do it. You can make that for the anterior, you can make it for the posterior, just some preps to hold. Or if you want, you can use uh, a crown forcep, which has the ability, you know, you can hold on to it whichever way you want. Whichever of these methods that suits your needs, that's the way to go. But we can go ahead and um, apply some material here. Let's say if you want to have a little bit a, uh, on a posterior, we don't do a lot with posteriors, right? We mainly just do uh, uh, maybe some bluish on the cusp tips, maybe some um, uh, brown within the, within the cervical. Um, you can actually use a endo file, if you will, and drag it through, you know, your cervical, your, your occlusal table to make it nice. Um, or you can use some brown to show the corn, kind of stain it as well. We can add some white to the cusp tips or blue. Very easy here. Now, this would be silenated. After you silenate it, we kind of do a, a, a dry brush technique, if you can see here. So I've got the stain liquid here. And you can either take the liquid and mix it in the, with the white in its own little well. You've got about 10 minutes of working time. After that, it does start to um, get a little uh, uh, tacky, if you will. But I'm gonna just use my brush and I am going to add a little bit here. Just to drag it over here, put a little, on the flat portion of your uh, plate here. And then using what we kind of call a, a dry brush technique, once your brush is saturated with the liquid, I can go ahead and bring it to the powder, pick it up, and then start mixing it with that liquid. And what you want to do is you want to continue to to smash it down using your, um, your brush, okay? So I'm going to continue to Break up any of those particles. If you need more liquid, you can do this. You want to make sure that just like uh, ceramic stains, once your brush is contaminated with a color, you're going to use a um, another uh, Kleenex or something to clean that brush if you go to a different color, unless you're going to mix. Otherwise, you're going to mix the white or whatever color it is into your other color. So once we know that this is uh, perfectly suitable for uh, for having a uh, the consistency that you want that you can work this stuff is very thick uh, it acts uh, kind of like a paint so we want to make sure that we use uh, a consistency that's going to be good so I'm going to brush my uh, brush off I'm going to go back into the liquid here and then I'm going to thin it out just a little bit more and then I'm going to add it to the cusp tips, if you will. Now, once you apply it, just like stains, once you apply it, it's gonna be fairly uh, thick. So then at that point, what you wanna do is make sure that you come back and you start thinning it out. So if you don't thin it out, um, you'll have like little edges to it and it'll look like a, a white spot. So we just wanna take it and we wanna thin it out to where we want it, okay? If there's too much, you can pick it up, use the Kleenex to take it off, and then you're gonna bring this down, and you're just gonna soften the edges. If you have an edge or a corner that's not feathered in, it's gonna look like a white spot. So we can do that anywhere we want along the cusp tips if that's what's needed, okay? What if we need blue? Blue gives depth. So we can take do the same thing with the blue. We can put some over here, add it to the to the, my plate here, and we would have some blue. So again, blue is the same thing. Uh, it gives depth. So does black. You can use the black and the white and get yourself some gray and then add a little blue. So these are fully um, compatible with each other so you can mix and match to get the color that you want, the effect. You can also then go back and maybe add a little bit to your cusp. So you can see here that it's a blue dot right now. So again, you're gonna make sure that you have enough liquid in your brush. 
And then as long as you've got enough liquid in your brush, you can then come back and start spreading it around nice and thin, right? And you're going to feather it all out so that it no longer looks like a blue spot, but you're just looking at to get that effect, that bluish effect. Now, once what you put on, the thing about light cured materials is once you cure it, it's going to look exactly how you how you have it. So if it looks blue, too much blue uh, on your cuss tips, uh, then it's going to come out too blue. So you need to make sure that you go ahead and thin it out to the desired uh, thinness that looks uh, natural, right? So you don't have any grains, you don't have any real dark spots. So just keep working it until you blend it in the way you want. Okay? So if you feather it out, it looks subtle. You still have the translucent effect. You can put it all the way down onto the triangular ridges and so forth. Uh, break it up. But you can create whatever translucency levels you can. Uh, with that blue. Uh, if it's an anterior, same thing. You know, if I want a, a halo effect, uh, maybe I use that uh, uh, corn color, a mix of the corn, mix of the uh, the brown itself. Again, I'm just going to put a little bit of liquid here. Uh, I'm going to kind of wet it a little bit on my on my crown here. Just to break up the uh, uh, the dryness, right? Make it a little bit more flowable when I apply it. I'm going to pick up some some brown here and mix it in the liquid. And again, you mix it so this is fairly thin. It looks like paint, so um, there, it's got a very deep concentration of chroma to these stains. So you just want to break them up a little bit. You can then take it and you can add it to the incisal edge here. A little bit more towards the lingual incisal edge. So just a little bit on your edge here. A little bit more towards the lingual. Okay. And then you can start creating a area in which you have, um, you know, a, a halo effect. If you need some translucency underneath it, again, you just go back to the blue and maybe pick up a little bit of blue. And then you're going to add it to it so that it's a little bit underneath the halo, kind of like a, a W, if you will. Okay. And then at that point, then you just take it. And you rinse out your, your brush, make sure that it's got enough uh, liquid to it. Because now what you're going to do is you're going to break it down. And you're going to brush it and feather it out so that you break up the actual solid blue line. And it looks more translucent. So you can do that. You can form it, shape it any way you want. And if you've done it right, okay, so you're going to look at it, and it will kind of give a translucent look to it, a little bit more than what you had before. So if you just keep working that, again, it's a little too much uh, corn here uh, color, but you can make the halo, and you can start thinning it out with your brush, a little bit more translucent here. And then, of course, you can start making the cervical as well. So that's basically how you're going to characterize your um, material. So, again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to, um, to ask me. And we will uh, let me get on back to the PowerPoint here. And we will continue this and finish this up. So, again, everything we've done today, plus the ones we've done every week, uh, every Thursday, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard, 
uh, 12 p uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. All of these are uh, archived on our social media, whether it's you, YouTube, Vita North America, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Go ahead and, and, and find us and, and review those. Uh, if you have any future uh, uh, questions or future topics that you'd like to see, you can always email us as well. Next week, uh, we do have a, another one next Thursday. Uh, we're going to be talking about zirconia and how to color, how to infiltrate it, how to add uh, an internal color to give you a little bit more depth, uh, whether it's a, a color, a characterization color, or whether it's maybe it's just more of a A color or more of a B color. So that'll be called the Providing the Ultimate Natural Looking Zirconia Restoration is Possible. It'll be a nice uh, subject matter for those of you who do the zirconia and want to learn more about uh, internal coloring and external coloring as well. But that's next week, next Thursday. And then if you uh, need to get a hold of us for any questions, certainly do. It's B to North America, the help desk. Uh, you can contact us on our toll-free numbers. You can email at us at uh, help at vitanorthamerica.com. Of course, um, you can also personally, if you want to email me, uh, jmcguire at vitanorthamerica.com as well. Uh, so I'll ask right now, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to type them in and ask away. Otherwise, we are um, getting close to our um, you know, 30 minute, 40 minute uh, webinar target that we try to get these through so that you don't spend a lot of time just on a webinar because I know everybody is uh, webinared out. They're fatigued on this stuff. So we try to do these very quick, half hour, 40 minutes with questions. So if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to, to type them in. If not, in a few seconds, we will go ahead and uh, complete and finalize this, this webinar. So I hope everyone enjoyed this, uh, learned something about it, maybe stirred some questions about the material, the anamic, what it is, what it's used for, the indications, how to characterize, how to polish it. Um, so we try to run the whole gambit and get through everything that might answer all of your questions. So I hope this uh, was good for you. If not, you know, please make sure that you email us and send us some additional topics or questions you may have. Because again, we do this every Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, every Thursday, the Beta Learning webinar. Uh, please join us again, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for attending, and this concludes our webinar.